Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Grow Your Path to Wellness. Amanda and I, we host a new guest and release a new episode every week. So be, ter- be sure to subscribe, um, like, share with all your loved ones, and follow us so that way you don't miss out on new episodes. Well, last week, we talked all about financial self-care and wellness and with Mary Bicknell. This week, we are excited to welcome Christine Fenrick to discuss all about the critical importance of cultivating community and a sense of support and the role of that in healing trauma. So we are so happy to have you with us, Christine. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be with you two today. Let's get it. Yes, welcome, Christine. So for all of you that have been faithful listeners to Kelsey and I's Grow Your Path to Wellness podcast, you know how much we are fanatics of TikTok. Christine is another TikTok friend. (laughs) Um, And also, uh, I wanted to make sure I added a quick note in here that it's Pride Month. So happy Pride Month, everyone. We see you and we hear you and you matter. Uh, Christine, thank you so much for being here. It's so, um, we were talking a little bit before we started recording, but it's always so surreal and so comforting to see our TikTok friends Mm-hmm. in like real time because it's as if we already know you but our community doesn't know you so tell us a little bit about yourself who are you what's your background what do you do now and why the topic of cultivating community today so thanks for having me first of all it's great to see each one of you in this wonderful call and that i'm so proud that y'all are doing this and thank you for giving a platform to all of the all of the community that you're you're building my name is Christine Venrick. I am on TikTok known as the trauma lady. And if that doesn't give you an idea of what I do, then, you know, you might need to check it. So, um, but I am a peer led trauma support counselor, trauma group support counselor, and I run and hold safe space for all types of trauma, PTSD, complex PTSD, projection sensitivity dysphoria, and also all of those small T traumas that might have collected over your life. And what we do, because I have a team with me also called the Trauma Family, and my Trauma Family is a community, is a safe space where safety, security, and stability are our number one goals for anyone to enter into the community. And that is gearing the tools to them, that is modeling behavior and mirroring behavior of what trauma healing looks like and also what trauma work looks like. So, and it started because my story, if I can't tell you all the traumas and can't relate to those, then why would I be called the trauma lady, right? So I have a lot of experience um, in my lovely 43 years of being on this planet in every area of trauma. And what started trauma family for me was I moved to a safe house because I was in a domestic violence, narcissistic abuse situation. um, And I had to leave everything I knew. And I moved into a safe house and I looked around and I was in the middle of my trauma recovery. I had to leave my trauma therapist, leave my community, leave my family, everything. And I went to a safe house and I went, well, now what? There's no one around me. Who do I, what, what do I do now? And the idea was you need others that look like you. You need support. You need those that are going to keep educating you and challenging you and giving the tools and where I could learn how to be a recovering trauma victim and change that from victim to survivor to warrior And that is ultimately my goal for our community is to bring those who need to be seen, heard and validated into the spotlight and say, it's safe enough for you to do this. And this is how we do this. It's not just you. This is how we do this together. So that has been and my ultimate goal is to really bring forth a community of safety, security and stability for others that are walking along the same path. I love this so much. I know we were talking some before recording and things, but I I appreciate you and the work that you are doing. So Thanks. I'm excited to see like what comes next for you and what you're doing. 
I am too. It started in November. My kid said, oh, this is TikTok. And I was like, <laughs> not for. And she handed me the phone and I went, well, that's pretty cool. And it all started. I was like, well, what would my name be? What would my name be? And when I was in North Carolina, someone came up to a friend of mine and said, you know, Christine, she's running the support group. And she goes, oh, the trauma lady. Yeah, there it is. And I went, you know what? That'll be sick. I approve. I highly approve of that. And it's it's been an empowering, it's been an empowering title for me to have because I feel that I've earned it and I feel that it is a respect place of accountability, integrity, and authority in what we're doing. And if I can do it, that means that I can model it for anyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm so excited for to get into kind of the nitty gritty here. And I think let's just go ahead and I have so many questions in my brain, but can you explain to our audience, our community, what exactly a peer led support group is? So a peer led support group is someone is, is a group of individuals that are coming together with a leader that is not a certified doctorate in therapy or any of the, the, any of the avenues that you would normally encounter in trauma therapy. Um, so me coming in as a novice and not being a certified therapist, but bringing my experience of guiding others, teaching others and holding space with safety practices is really what the core group is about. So it's about those that look like you, sitting with you, meeting you where you are, walking with you when you stand and sitting down when you need to. So it's a more intense, and I like to call it the stopgap method in between therapy and life. Christine, can I ask, is your peer led support group because where I'm from at least and I believe all across the country there are certified peer supporters is that your realm or is yours more like grassroots both okay. so I I do have the uh, peer led certified support group status and certifications but also creating something from nothing is how this started and when i got somewhere and i said where are my peeps that's when i really had to put the boots on the ground and say well what does it need to look like and how does that serve communities that don't talk about trauma you know we talk about specific disorders. We talk about specific diagnoses, diagnoses, and then we categorize and then, you know, go into those categories. For me, trauma is life. Trauma is not just one event. It is a series of events that accumulate until you get to the point where the pain is too much. And when the pain is too much, I get the question, what is it and how do I stop it? And that is the ultimate question in a community. What is it and how do I stop it? I could go to a million therapists and they would be fantastic in their realms of tools, but the accessibility of 24 seven care to peers around you going through the same things, experiencing the same struggles or the same wins, because it's not just about the struggle, it's about the win. You know, it's about the, the goal and the winning and coming back to life. So I like to say I enable people to become alive again and to lead their best life, whatever that looks like now. That's and so, so that, the, yeah, that is, that is really the essence of the peer support group is how do we model that behavior and learn from each other? as well as learning to ourselves, into ourselves. Now you mentioned the tool, you know, you might be able to go to a therapist and get tools. So that's a good pivot to our next uh, question here is what 
tools might someone find in a peer support group versus going to therapy even if they or do they overlap and how do, how do those support groups look different what can someone expect going to that sort of support you know community right so really the ultimate goal there's about four trauma recovery goals that i like to keep in our it in the forefront one is learning how to become calm and focused because with PTSD, complex PTSD, and many of the trauma things, we have brain damage. And it's not a, oh, it's invisible, it's a soul wound, it's a thing. Legitimately, you have brain damage. And now it is, how do you learn how to live your best life with the obstacles, whatever that came from now? And also, how do you become present and alive? Oftentimes with trauma, the past is breathing down your neck. Doesn't matter if it was 40 years ago, 400 years ago, two days ago. How do you become present in your existence again? That is a wonderful way for us to learn how to be calm as far as coping mechanisms, you know, breaking cycles of habits. Um, also, learning how to be honest. Honesty is the biggest part for me, especially on my journey. Learning how to be honest with myself and others was the biggest part and key and the big step to my recovery systems. Because I can fake it like everybody else. We learn how to mask in trauma, right? There is no horizon to hold on to. So you're just going with every wave. And, and expressing that as, oh, okay, that was fine. Okay, that's good. But learning how to be honest in that journey and making plans, again, and choices that go with your inner core of who you are in that healing process cannot be expressed enough. So I like to say, I will meet you where you are, but when you want to stand up, it's going to be an honest stance on firm ground. Christina, because I'm in really quick because I love the way you worded that because Amanda and I, we, anybody who's listened to us or knows us, we do so much work with individuals because on our therapist's you know, side where we, we know, and we all overlap here, but we know what trauma does to, it does, it tells our brain it's not safe to be present, right? Kind of biologically for simplicity's sake of this conversation but I love how you work in honesty and into the act of being present because if you think about it if I am you know I'm reactive and I'm you know telling these lies or I'm not being honest internally with myself I'm either out here in the future or I'm back in the past and I'm not being present so I love thank you so much for the way you tied that in. I had to, I had to chime in. So but thank you. you're welcome. But learning how to be in your body again and, and to be present in your body is for trauma sufferers, probably one of the hardest obstacles to overcome and to befriend because there's so much that happens within the body that we fragment and leave the body in trauma to stay safe, just safe nothing else our brain loves to just keep us safe until the conditions change you know and then looking at it as a moral failing or all of the all of the baggage that comes with that you have to start breaking that down and who am i now today am i safe enough to look at that honestly and can i be safe enough to be present that's a hard journey so if you can befriend the body, you can befriend the mind, and you can befriend your spirit and figure that out, it's like learning how to walk and talk and breathe again and, and how to set your life up for better choices when your brain begins to heal. So using mindfulness techniques, you know, we use a lot of I am safe. I created a mindfulness workbook because those were the things that worked for me along my journey when no one else was teaching it. I was like, oh, that practice works for me. Let's put it down. We go through 
if I start on a topic and I hit all of the brain body, you know, education systems, I'm going to say, okay, we need to pause because the pause for trauma sufferers has the lasting impact of reset. And that reset is so important when coming into your own life again and your own body and allowing yourself to know that it's going to be uncomfortable. There might be tears. There's going to be snot. There's going to be fighting and there's going to be anger and all those complexities that came with it. But to sit in the pause, you have survived so much more and you can survive sitting in your body again. That's when the light comes on. And that's what I work for. I work for people to come alive again in their life and to come out of the fog because there's such, such cog fog in trauma suffering. You know, all of the brain mechanisms are like, no, no, everything's on fire. And learning how to say, you know what? It's really not on fire. I just feel like it. And I want to get out. I want to escape. And what do those escape looks? What do those escapes look like in life? Because trauma comes with addiction. Trauma comes with, you know, tons of forms of mind and body dissonance that amnesia, chest pains, body, you know, polyvagals, working from the top up, from the top down, the bottom up. All of those approaches are ways that this community can come in and say, this might not work for you right now, but I want to show you what it looks like at a different part of a journey. And I think that reflection and mirroring is vital to trauma sufferers because therapists get an hour. That's it. How can I go in in an hour and let it all loose and bless my therapists, bless them. They were godsends. And the one now I have is I'm like calling her like, can you double book me today? Because I know when it's too much for me and I need a mirror versus a reflection internally that will make me go, I can't be in my body. I got to go. Let's run. You know, let's make some bad safety decisions right now. But allowing myself to evolve and grow out of safety versus fear is a huge gift to a trauma survivor. And that's what I would like to give is the light that I found in the darkness. I want to share that light and give that light to everyone else because their darkness is just as bad as mine was. I love that. And then, and you were in those peer support groups. I heard you say what I heard you say being present, like being honest. So like regulating yourself. I heard you mention mindfulness techniques. And then what were our last two of those before? I keep chiming in and cutting you off. I'm sorry. Education. Uh, yes. Education is the power of knowing what you know and knowing what you're learning and putting the names to the things. Because like I said, what is it and how do I stop it? That's normally what I get. What is it? Okay, then tell me what it looks like to you. What is it caused? You know, what are you feeling? What are you going through? Where are your thought processes? How does it affect all of your life? So working in that as a, in a safe place, you're not going to get, you're not going to get pushback. You're going to be allowed to say what you say and have time to reflect that. And then I'm going to call you back into yourself because all of the fragments that we pushed out in trauma are still there. They're waiting to be called back. And that is powerful. That's self-empowerment to a trauma survivor where I might not want to do the inner child work. I might not want to do the shadow work. I might not want to do the cognitive work. But I know that the goal is bigger than the struggle now. So putting it in a perspective of a small, and I don't say we ever do anything 100%. I say we do things in 3%. If you can modify something in 3%, that 3% accumulates every day. That small accumulation is where the joy is. And how often do you see trauma survivors that have not experienced joy, true joy 
and will not allow themselves to because it was never safe to begin with. Giving someone the opportunity and the capacity to feel joy. Oh man, I don't need a paycheck because that is a gift that will give their children, their children's children, their community. It's a payoff. That 3% of work, that 3% of that goal, it's going to pay off and it's going to show someone how to be resilient in their own life and give their own tools. Cause I can't fix you. You can fix you. I can't fix you, but I can give you tools when you need them to put in your little trauma tool belt and pull them out when you know what you know and need to feel what you feel. So those things, mindfulness is very massively important. No one wants to do it. Why do I, do I want to sit in my traumatized body? Are you kidding me? I'm trying to get out of this thing. You know, I always call it the flesh prison because sometimes it just feels like we're stuck in our bodies as trauma survivors. And we're not actually thinking about what is going on. We're not present in our life. So being present and communicating with ourselves, our body, and giving ourselves the ability to be number one priority. Number one priority is very difficult in the community I am in because it has always been about someone else, someone else's goal, someone else's image, and never been able to flush out the individual versus the need for someone else to get what they wanted. So that, that's very important. And finding physical safety, you know, finding what makes you secure. What are your needs, not your wants, because needs are primary. What is it that you actually need out of your body, out of your friendships, out of your relationships, out of your money, out of your goals? You know, what are the pressures that you're putting on yourself that can be let go of? You know, what was implanted versus what are you planting? And how do you do that with intention? And that is really comes down to modeling, mirroring, education, um, safety practices, and, and showing up when you don't feel like it. Showing up when you don't feel like it is one of the biggest challenges for any person that disassociates. Because I can show my body up, but my brain is in disassociation station. Two, two, gone, gone. And that safety for me to pull myself back is such an empowering experience that I know I can pull myself back from the past and back from the future to be in the present and make them match in body, in mind, in spirit. And learning how to have a sense of identity. Mm -hmm. You know, creating the ability and the safe place to create your own identity. Right. What does it mean? And what, what does it look? How do I want to show up in the world? Yeah. And who am I bringing? Mm -hmm. As human beings, what is our number one question? Who am I? Right. We all get to that point of some sort of like, you know, middle age breakdown. I'd like to say I've had about 42 of them all in 43 years. But who am I? Is one of our biggest questions as human beings. Mm -hmm. How do I be a better version of who I am right now? Not just, does it have to be black and white? Can it be fluid? And I think something, Christine, too, that comes to mind with that is not only who am I, but on the topic of today, who am I amongst the rest of everyone amongst my community amongst my social environment who and how do i fit in am i being rejected you know Ooh. those wounds of rejection abandonment they are massive and they can bleed all over you if you're not careful and who am i right now versus who am i in the universal definition of who i am who I am is I do no harm to myself and I do no harm to others. And whatever that looks like in my life, I will allow it. 
because, and I always go back to Pete Walker's um, rules of fairness and intimacy, those 21 rules, if you can get through 21 rules and not have a kick in your face or a kick in your gut, those call myself back to myself. I'm not going to project. I'm going to literally be right here for whatever is needed for me right now. And I also have a modicum to ask for support. What? Asking for support from others that in a trauma survivor, others have hurt us. So why would I get the, the, the trust up to only be let down again and working on that rejection that lives in us subconsciously or unconsciously and causes the fight or flight, freeze, fawn, collapse responses, brings awareness to something that you never understood before. And that's why I like working in the education experiences. You know, most of the education I give out is all public domain. So I don't have to be the subject matter expert. I can go to subject matter experts and show you where to go on your journey. If that's where you wanna go, but you, these are the avenues to where you can find the information, the accessibility, and the commonality in the community one-on-one -on -one versus just who do I look like on the internet? Who do I look like in my life? But who do I connect with? That is fear. Because when we open ourselves up to new relationships and none of the other relationships have worked out and we're sitting with ourselves, I don't wanna sit with myself. I avoided myself for a long time, but getting to know myself and knowing that it looks like others. And I love watching the light bulb of other people going, oh, that's me too. I didn't even know that had a name. What do you mean that's got a name? And like, well, what does that mean? I'm like, okay, well, here's the name and here's how we Google it. But giving people the options to explore themselves again, man, it is a light that just it'll knock out any darkness. Mm -hmm. Amanda and I always say that's like one of not speaking for her. I do that all the time, but we've talked about it so often. Those mom, those light bulb moments that you see in a session, I'll sit and it can be something very small that we say that sparks for them. It's like, Holy cow. Not that we're identifying. We're helping things make sense is what we're doing for them. They're like, that's what that is. Uh -huh. so that makes sense. And, and we talk about, okay, what purpose did whatever that, relationship that behavior that habit that whatever that response it served a purpose at one time so but it's not necessarily the same purpose or it's not needed anymore yeah that light bulb moment is like incredible well we call them in the trauma family we call those the boops because literally they feel like a boop yeah like, it's a i got booped and we look for the boop moments because the boop moments stick. Mm -hmm. I can give you a thousand sentences, but unless it applies to you and where you are, everything else is just going to be noise. Mm -hmm. How do you eliminate the noise to get the most boops out of your day and out of your seconds, your minutes, not just, oh, this is what I want to do in my life and lofty goals, but how do you sit in the seconds that are hard? Mm -hmm. when the flashbacks hit or when you have emotional flashbacks or body flashbacks or you know all of these things that seems to have shame blame and guilt based around them because for trauma what keeps trauma alive shame right and what is the antithesis to shame courage right it's all fear-based so if you can learn how to be courageous and vulnerable in those moments that you're honest and reflective, you are winning the battle of joy and you're winning the battle of safety over fear because fear is, I don't care what anybody says, fear is the driving factor in our society. Mm -hmm. Fear is the driving factor in systemic traumas. Um, when we get a pushback, it is normal someone's fear that will negate their power. And as abuse victim, 
the fear kept you small. I'm so glad you said power because I was like, and power. <laughs> and then you, it came out of your mouth. Yeah, because when someone takes power away from you, what are your options? The other thing I was thinking um, before we go on to our next point is that, okay, Callie, thank you. Um, <laughs> for a lot of folks, like my own clients, people on the internet, they tend to look at therapists or mental health practitioners or mental health professionals in the field as like unaffected, perfect. We just do everything perfectly all the time. And so I always take every opportunity I can to say, I find it really hard to sit in discomfort because nobody taught me that. Nobody teaches this in society, right? You, you don't go to school and learn emotional regulation. You don't go to the doctor and they talk to you about the importance of preventative wellness so that you can not develop a laundry list of chronic disease and illness. So I take every opportunity I can on a public platform to say, we're humans too. And so I, that's something that's a work in progress for me every day because I wasn't given that skill. And so I went through life doing what my body knew how to do to keep me safe and protected. And yeah. so now undoing that and retraining my body and my brain, it's a work in progress for me too. So I just had to interject with that. Like we are all human and we're living this human experience ourselves and it's okay. I love that you said that because ultimately the goal of any recovery is to learn how to be a better human. It's not learning how to be a hundred percent golden, perfect human, because we have that, that, that P word should be right up there with any other cuss word. And in society, it is, is very different in each facet of society of what that means generationally, you know, all the stigmas that come with the perfect idea. And we can take it into every dynamic, I mean, every demographic of what does perfect look like. And perfect normally looks like the parenting expectation that you had growing up, whether that was good or bad. It can be a neutral, it can be good enough, but it's something that you can modify for you. You don't have to keep it because the fear of existing anymore in that perfection, it's not even, it's not even applicable. It's not attainable. And to say, I am just a human trying to be a human, trying to be a better human, trying to help humans. Oof. Oof. Who would do this for a living? Y'all do. I just like, oh no, this happened to come up on me. I'm fine. But y'all are vulnerable in that and have boundaries. And boundaries are things that we often do not learn. We are learned that there is a no with a consequence, not a boundary with an option. And, and that is through all respect. I respect you, you respect me. Right, right. I'm not gonna be respected if I say no. Right. And can I do the pause instead of filling the space? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do I perform? Do I perform my perfectionism or do I practice the human beingism? Mm -hmm. Okay. I heard you say something a minute ago and it automatically took my brain to this next point. And I'm curious about it. And in the work that you're doing. How has, like I heard you say, like showing up even whenever you don't feel like it and like bringing your body here, like, okay, I'm, I'm here even though my brain may be everywhere else or I just, I don't want to be here. Um, but then that led me to, we kind of still in the midst of a pandemic and a lot of things transitioning to online and maybe there was an online option before, but can you touch on a little bit of how, like, how online formats have changed, like your perspective of your work you're doing in the healing community. We've talked about ours, but your perspective of that. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, when in Rome, right? 
And if this was the opportunity that came up at this moment versus having to go to and book a room and invite people to show up, Online community has, and I, lo I love to say this, I can do trauma in my pajamas. I show up with my pink bathrobe with no makeup on, no expectation of anything. I'm just showing up as is today. To give that safe space without the idea of performing has been a major shift in what online community looks like. If I can mirror the fact that I do not feel well that day, cause I'm a chronic, you know, I have, I have chronic diseases and chronic illnesses and things like that. But that means that someone else out there just needs the ability to turn it on versus showing up. And showing up physically is very different than showing up emotionally for many of us. I'm lucky if I get that three day shower you know, and my pajamas have taken on their own form. I want to be able to show up in those and be just as authentic as if you saw me in person. And that is the difference in online communities now versus when I started was the idea of the image versus the reality of the healing. Because no one comes to you perfect in healing. Everybody's got snot and tears and blood and scars and, you know, funk on them. And I still have funk on me, but that means that I can still lead, show up and be accountable and present, even when that is the only thing I can do and still be safe. Because we have this idea of this online community is just, oh, it's all these people talking back and forth. My job is to keep those that are trust me to keep their environment safe for them to process. Just like a, someone would come into your room, you know, as a therapist into your office. That is my goal. But I can do that for 50 people. I can do that for 10 people. I can do that for 200 plus people in an online community because they're figuring the boops out as they go. Me showing up just might mean it gives someone the courage to show up in their pajamas. Cool. If that's all the gift is that you need today, I'm great with that. Even if you just needed to get out of your head, work that. Work with what you have. I will meet you where you are. That does not mean you have to come to a physical place to get what I've got. And I believe that has changed the online communities and the perception of what does it mean to have to show up to do the work? You don't even have to, all you gotta do is turn it on. I don't care if you're laying in bed in the dark and you've cried for three days and had PTSD flashbacks and you are in a spiral, just come in and listen. Most of the time I have people that will fall asleep just because it is the safest place that they can be and just having someone with them, a community with them, checking in on them, and then them being accountable to others while not having to have a physical sensation of, and the anxiety of a physical relationship with someone. Because with trauma, I don't want anybody near my body. And just navigating the physicalness of trauma is hard enough, but this gives us a platform to say, you can be safe and you can just show up. I don't even care if you're in your pajamas, just don't let me see it, you know, just, and what does that look like with you where you are today? I don't have to make plans. And going into that, I'm getting ready to start a trauma 101 group and it's six weeks of trauma teaching, just the basics of trauma and then start, you know, have support groups on the back end of that to say, okay, we talked about this. What does this look like in a Zoom group, not just on a TikTok group? Because confidentiality is also something that I highly regard. It is the most important part of my, my experience as a peer counselor is to keep the confidential confidential and to keep those people safe that are in my care because they don't feel safe. Just like with professionals, that is my goal, is to make my online community as safe as possible 
whatever avenue that looks like to meet someone where they are, not bring them to where I am. It's such a good point you make. Um, it just has me thinking, like, you know, we mentioned earlier, you, you, we've gotten to know each other via TikTok, and now we feel like we know each other, and I've developed relationships with people, and, um, you know, like, the I know the mental health TikTok creators um, retreat that they did, like, they all felt the same way when they met in person. They felt like they already knew each other, and I've had, um, you know, clients on telehealth that, it appears, you know, I didn't know them before. They were new clients, but they open up what feels like sooner than they might have in person. And so then when they do see you in person, it's like, oh, yeah. safety, connection, right? Um, and so that kind of leads me to my next question because I've had a client that found, is finding uh, addiction recovery recently and started to attend some online support groups, um, you know, like online meetings, right? So there's the specialized AA, NA, Al-Anon, you know, all of the NAMI for like the mental health. What is the difference between a community versus a support group? And that is a fantastic question because we're often in the middle of reformulating what we think right? When it comes to groups, when it comes to groups of people, we are reformulating what does all that mean? So for me, a support group is literally a block of time that where you get the confidential one-on-ones in a small group experience where we're going to sit down and just talk about a specific topic, right? And you get to go to that every time and we're going to work through those add more tools and do that for a specific amount of time in a support group, like a standard support group, like NAMI and, you know, AA and all of that. Our groups, we do it from a trauma perspective, not just a diagnostic perspective, not just one thing. We're going to talk about all the things because I don't know about you, but trauma is in everything. So if I can bring that in an umbrella and then let you decide how it applies to you on your way, that's great. An online community for me is when we can all get together with the same goal in mind, share and enjoy, create, watch growth with each other and still be stable and be accountable to each other and our experiences in the outside world also. And what does that do when it brings others together that welcome someone? You know, my support group, I do it a support group because I want to make sure that there's a next step in the stopgap. I don't believe just one online forum will do that enough when it comes to healing, because that can be very dangerous. Um, when it comes to, you know, experts coming out and speaking about things and, and I'm like, no, no, that you need to show up and show me because I'm not going to trust just anybody. A sound clip is really great, but can you show me, you know, what you know, and walk what you walk and talk what you talk. So having an online community that keeps you accountable and keeps you involved and keeps it maybe lighter than what a support group might get to because you might not be ready for a support group you know and you might not have that need but you want a community where you're gaining tools through others learning and mirroring and modeling what that means and what is the education you might need to do that on your own you might not be ready for a support group yet but to take it at the time and the availability but to create all levels of a safe space you know, can the novice come into my online support group? Probably not. I want to make sure you you are a match before I put you in something that it might be more traumatizing to you. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that we have that relationship and that connection to where you understand that, yeah, you can call me at three in the morning. But am I going to take a call from an online group, you know, from an online community? Yeah, I might. But you're going to send me a DM first. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's a level of intimacy that also has to be regulated with accountability 
And that is the difference between that online community versus an online support group, because the online support group might be the stopgap method between you and your therapist. It might be a further tool where you're going deeper into that versus a community is where you can gather information from all the sources, but you know that they're right there when you need them. Yeah. I was thinking like when you said stopgap between you and your therapist, I was like, or your next use. Yeah. Or your next unhelpful behavior. Yep. But it's not uh, uh, words. It's not a broad approach to healing, healing <laughs> the bigger issues. It's this one, okay, I got what I needed so that I didn't use again, or I got what I needed so I didn't go back to my abuser. I got what I needed so I, like, quote unquote, made the right decision in that moment or um, got that need met in that moment. But the bigger picture healing is where the community is. Yeah, and, and, and to understand that even in the micro moments of trauma, that you're still gonna probably be dealing with shame, blame, and guilt, and that wheel might be spinning, but it might spin differently for you because of your past experiences. But to know that there's someone to reach out to is probably one of the best anchors and preventions for further damage. Mm -hmm. In our field, we say nothing, not just, I mean, it's really common in the field of addiction, but, you know, just in, in the healing profession, we say nothing good um, comes from isolation. No. And and it it oh, breeds right. so many things. Right. And, and, in the area that I'm in, you know, we have a lot of unaliving thoughts. Mm -hmm. We have the thoughts that are scary that no one wants to talk about, that there's a stigma and a shame around that you might not be able to go to your partner and say, this is what I'm feeling. And this is what I'm thinking. And this is how long it's been. And because of that fear of how it's going to change something yeah. to be able to look at someone and say, oh, wow, you do that too. How do you fix that? Or how do you, how are you working towards that to make it better, more resolved? These are the tools. Trauma healing is really, and, and I hate to use the hokey word, but holistic. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a one diagnostic shop. It's not a one symptom shop. It is literally when people come in and they say, well, how do you know you have trauma? Are you in pain? When they go, what do you mean pain? Mm -hmm. Is what someone else caused you or what you experienced still causing you pain, emotional and physical, psychological, spiritual pain? And they go, well, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You are in the right place because ultimately trauma healing is dealing with pain and fear. Yeah. And, and if you Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Christine. Oh. And when you can frame that for someone to break it down, it's not about the, just the isolation. It's not about the dissonance. It's not about the flashbacks. It's not about the isolation and the relationship difficulties, but to look at it from all of the encompassing parts of what it looks like and give it a name. That is so empowering when you feel disempowered in the darkness. Yes. Giving things labels and and I know like those little bit of differences, we're not here for you to just identify with a label, but you're labeling things in order to have a, a path for that healing, like for things, for the puzzle pieces to click together, to start seeing like, holy cow. Yeah, like I'm building a picture of my pain, but also a path to healing the pain from those, the boops, the little. The boops and the intensity, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not just that you're going to feel it because everyone feels it, but what is the intensity and the longevity of the, what you're emotionally or physically feeling really does set you up for the next step. So if I can say, let's ground, let me pull you back a little bit. Let's just do an, I am safe practice. Let's do a five senses. Let's breathe. Let's do a polyvagal, you know, theory, or let's, let's build it up. Have you eaten today? Have you drank something today? You know, are you taking care of you? so that you are a number one priority in your healing. And what will that look like? Not just what does it look like right now, 
but what is it going to look like when this intense moment lessens and you come out and you want to explore it because you know you've just done a really, really hard thing? Because we can do hard things, but often, yeah, we can do some really hard things. And even just getting up some days is the hardest thing you're going to do. But it is doing the thing anyway. It is doing the thing anyway. And it is, it is showing up. And I like to say it's art, doing art for art's sake. It's not going to be a masterpiece. But you are going to express whatever you need to express and get out at that moment. And you might throw it in the trash. But it's worth it to go through that and explore that and grow it and evolve it. Because you are the priority. And it's about the process. And the process, man, the process is what scares us away from the product. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge Glennon Doyle fanatic. So when you said we can do hard things, I was like, yes. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. We can do hard things. And often you are stronger than you think and braver than you know. Mm-hmm. And it all, and then one of my other cliche things that I always live by is it always seems impossible until it's done. Mm-hmm. Like it's always Mount Everest until you break it down into the individual summits and figure out what tools you need and equipment you need and you get one done at a time. And then you're like, shit, I'm at the top of a damn mountain. How did I get here? All right, cool. Like, yeah. but you're like, then- I can't climb that mountain. Nope. I can't climb that mountain. Nope. (laughs) Right. The anxiety of the what's next and what if Mm -hmm. is always bigger than the doing of the deed. Uh And when I know for me, my, my journey has been to understand that I have ADHD and I have learning disorders now that, you know, I'm, I'm 43. So I was in that, that gap area of going, well, you know, we have extremes, but you're still gifted you know, to have that gifted perfectionism and then going, but that don't make no sense. What the hell? What, you know, what, that don't make no sense. And to learn the complexity of how and what I need versus what I was told I needed to do is very different in healing. You can tell me what I need to do all you want. What I can do is very different than what I think I can do. And when we put that in a perspective of getting the fear out of the way to do the thing, that makes a shift and that makes a change. And that is a lasting change that you can call on every single time. It is that neuro, is that that flexibility It is, you know, it is the mindfulness. It is all of those things that we create to get better, not bitter. I love all of this. Okay. Well, um, Christine, I, I know I, Amanda, I like every guest we have, but we say this, like we can literally talk probably all day. We could sit here and record all day long and break down everything into all of these subtopics that my brain sits here and does that I don't say out loud, Um, but we always, always, again, like I said, thank you for joining us. And we always ask every single guest if there is, if they have any last minute thoughts or like little tidbits, pieces of information or a mantra of sorts to leave our listeners with. And then if you can let them know where they can find you online. Absolutely. I want to say that I love, I am a big vessel person. I am, I am a boop book. We renamed the body keeps the score, the boop book, because every time we open it, it gets a new boop. No matter how many times you read it, it gets a new boop. But what stuck with me is what has happened cannot be undone, but what can be dealt with are the imprints of the trauma on the body, the mind, and the soul. And it is a work in progress, not a destination. And when you get to a level where it felt great and you did it, 
just know that you're leveling up. That that leveling up is just as scary as when you started the last one, but you can do this. And you can not have to do it alone. You can do this with other people who look like you've had those experiences. And it's important because every trauma matters not just the definitive ones but all the small t's versus the big t's those matter and it's getting to yourself as the number one priority that changes things so uh and you can find me right now on tiktok at the trauma lady um hashtag trauma family because that's where our community creates with each other and shares their experiences as well soon i will be having a new website come out and i'm excited we're on a social media journey right now to create all of the things i've been told i must i must keep going um i cannot be complacent anymore uh and as in our trauma journey you gotta get big because you've been small for so long, let it out, let that light shine. So you can find me on TikTok for right now. Um, the trauma matter, I'm sorry, the trauma family at Gmail is the email for us. And uh, I, we do regular lives and also do a book club on TikTok, which Amanda has come in and, and been so wonderful to break down sessions, but we take books about trauma and take the trauma stories and triggers out, but get down to the nitty gritty of what does it do and what can we learn? And it's always there and available. And you can always catch me there. Um, you can also catch me at the trauma family at gmail.com if you need advice. Um, I'm creating new, new content constantly now. But I wanna tell you thank you both for you creating the spaces to have these hard conversations. and. Um, and to explore them as human beings, not just commodities. That, that is a wonderful gift that you are giving. And I, I truly, truly appreciate it. And I'm so glad TikTok brought us together as friends. I'm so thankful for you too, Christine. It's like there were so many moments where, and if, if Kelsey did it, I probably wanted to do it. I was just like, Amanda, just sit, sit down because... <laughs> <laughs> but every moment that like either Kelsey or the heart, you know, the people that are listening, but there were so many moments and it happens in a lot of our episodes where um, we're just so touched that like our hands go to our heart and that shows true connection, which I think is what this whole episode was about is the importance of community for connection and connection is a basic human need that we all need. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for what you do for everybody and creating that sense of connection in them. Because I know even though you're live on your TikTok and you can't see people, you can only read their comments. They're having those same moments of true, honest, genuine connection too. So we appreciate you. I love it. I love it. And the bigger, the better. And, and, you know, imagine what can be done, what we can shift if we hear the hurt. We will definitely make sure that we put all of your contact information in the show notes so people can reach out and follow you as needed. And we're excited for more content and a website from you too, and maybe a YouTube slash podcast from you too. <laughs> it's it's uh, in the process very, very soon, ma'am. Yes. yes. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in every week. Uh, we are excited. Next week, we will be having Lisa Schaefer back. This is her third time on the podcast, but it's her second episode of her Trauma Chakra Healing series. And this week, you know, coming up next week, we're going to be talking about the sacral, sacral, I think it's what? sacral <laughs> chakra. Um, and so, and how that relates to trauma healing too. So make sure you subscribe and so you don't miss out and you get the notifications on when all the latest episodes are, uh, and we will see you next week. Take care. Bye. Take care everyone. Bye. Okay. Sorry.